After this season, when Bo Nix moves on, Oregon football's quarterback room is talented and wildly unpredictable because it's got some depth, too. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, review wherever you listen to or watch this show. Today on this beautiful, wonderful Friday, we got my man Max Torres of the Ducks Dish Podcast covering Oregon for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated. He is tapped in on the recruiting trail. So we got some recruiting talk coming later the show as well, because recruiting just doesn't stop. And we never stop bringing Max on the show. My man, are we ready to absolutely rock and roll and send Oregon fans off into the weekend with a quality episode? Oh man, you, you know, the rules, we always got to do it. You know how we get down. No, man, I'm, it's a, it's a super fun time, you know, for the Oregon football community right now. I was trying to tell people the run was coming and I think we're in the midst of it right now, or at least it's kind of starting to kick off. So it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, it most definitely is. Now, the quarterback debate is going to be uh, quite pronounced by the time the season comes to a close. And this is just the mode that we're in. And it is fun to think about the future. There are only about eight different ways Oregon's quarterback room could play out next year. But as of now, they're slated to have four quarterbacks of the scholarship variety on the roster for spring 2024. Ty Thompson, Austin Novosad currently on the roster. And then you've got Michael Van Buren and Luke Moga incoming next year. If I gave you a thousand dollars max to bet on who, maybe you'd use Fandle. Maybe if I give you a thousand dollars to bet on which of those guys would be most likely to be Oregon starter one day, not necessarily in 2024, but be the full time starter one day for the Ducks. Who would you target? Oh, man, See, that, it's a really, really good question for sure. And let me just lay out some context so that people know kind of where my head's at with this. I think there's a couple of things you have to look at, right? You have to look at the sample size, the sample that we have from Ty Thompson. He's the only one who's played any college football. Um, I mean, I guess you could also throw in Austin Novosad in the spring game, but, you know, I don't think you can really count that for too much. So um, and then you have Van Buren and Moga who, who haven't played quarterback um, at the college level. Um, so it's, it's a tough one to decide. I mean, Oregon starter at some point, um, God, this is you really can kind hard. of make a case for any of them. No, you, you definitely could. I just feel like we haven't seen enough. I feel like Novasad and Ty have to be the most likely options just because they're the oldest and we've seen the most of them. Um, the, the thing is, you know, I feel like I kind of say the same thing about Thompson when I see him and, and I, and I don't, or every time I get asked about him and I don't want it to come off, like I'm not a fan of, of ties or anything, you know, it's just look at what we've seen from him. It looks the same every time. And, and I think that some of the, some of what I've been hearing is that it's still the case, you know, he still doesn't necessarily have that, that processing speed and, and the composure that you you'd want to see in, in your starting quarterback. And you just kind of wonder, you know, how long of a leash do you kind of give him? You know, when do you, when, when is he going to be that guy? If it, if he is going to be that guy at Oregon, you know, all the respect to him for sticking around at such a, with so much scrutiny, you know, and everyone's like, well, he was a former five star. Like, when's it going to happen? You know, I'm not trying to come off like super critical of him. So I just wanted to make sure I put that out there. But then, you know, Novasad, I think he's a really talented passer, but we just haven't seen too much. So I'm, I'm kind of stalling, just trying to think about what answer makes the most sense, because it's a really, really hard question. Um, I, I kind of feel... I, okay, hold on. Let, let, let me cut you off there, because I, I think that the fact that it's this hard to answer is indicative of what the answer actually is, which is you don't actually know. Like, there, like there's no clarity. There is no distinct, clear airtight future at the quarterback position in terms of which of these guys could be the starter. Cause I could make the case for all of them, right? Moga could play the long game, a guy or two transfers out and he's the starter in two years. Nova said could leap Ty Thompson on the depth chart next year. Van Buren could, you know, be a 2025 
sort of guy if they, you know, maybe bring someone in via the portal for for next year. I, I think that there isn't necessarily one guy that that stands out as the most likely to start because I think they all have a case, but I don't think any of their cases are, are necessarily airtight right now. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of the, the way you have to look at it, especially when two of the guys aren't even on campus yet. But I think, you know, if we're trying to project a little bit, you know, I, I kind of feel like I'm more geared towards Novasad or Van Buren right now. Um, you know, Moga, when I went out to Arizona and saw him last week, his coach was saying, you know, he's not even close to scratching the surface of his potential, which is really exciting. But he also is a raw quarterback prospect in, in that regard. Um, so there's a little bit more, you know, growth and work that needs to be done. Van Buren, much more of a polished guy, plays a national schedule, has really produced at a high level. Same for um, Novasad before he got to Oregon, you know, playing against some of the best competition in the country out there in Texas. And I know that my kind of thing with him is that he needed to put on some weight, which I've heard he's done this off season. So I think I would be a little bit more geared to talk to towards uh, Novasad or Van Buren, at least right now. Yeah, my, my brutal Final Jeopardy style question here for you stems from a, a question that came in from uh, Nick, by the way, who's got another question we're going to answer here on the show. You can always get in the mailbag as every day or no YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Duck. So kind of uh, reframing that discussion, Max, a bit. Nick asks, of the three new quarterbacks, who do you see based on what you've heard and seen having the most upside? I see Austin Novasad as having the tools and having what it takes between the ears, but strongly lacking the physique at this stage, like you were talking about. I see Van Buren as having the talent and maturity, but lacking some between the ears from what I've heard about his decision-making. That was part of the Andrew Ivan scouting report on 24-7. As for Moga, I see lots of raw talent, but a lot to work with. Sorry so long. Don't even worry about sharing too many thoughts around here. We love hearing from all of you out there. So he's looking at the three new quarterbacks, right? Nova said Van Buren and Moga who haven't taken a college snap yet. So if you remove Ty Thompson and say, who's got the most upside, I think the answer is Van Buren. I, I think he's got that blend of arm talent and athleticism that the other two maybe don't, right? You could maybe look at Nova Sad and say, he's one of the better arm talents of, uh, of the three. Moga might be the best raw athlete of the three, but Van Buren, I think has the potential to be that blend. And I think he presents the the greatest upside of the three, removing Ty Thompson from, from that, from that calculation. What do you think? Uh, I'm going to go with Moga. I, th I think he has the, the most upside of those three guys. And I think a big part of it is because of the athleticism element that, that you alluded to, um, you know, Moga, his 2022 season was his first full-time season as the starting quarterback at Sunny Slope. Uh, he kind of had an interesting little story, you know, when he was uh, you know, playing high school ball, didn't play tackle football until high school, uh, an interesting little wrinkle there, um, you know, tidbit. But, you know, he played some wide receiver, played some running back. And, and I think that just getting to pick his brain and just seeing how there he is, just how composed and locked in he is, you know, definitely – just a really tremendous leader. You know, he's, he's the kind of guy that everybody on that team rallies around. And, you know, I remember at practice, they were like, you know, moving between drills and stuff. And like, you know, he was kind of barking out stuff like, Oh, go around us. Or like, come on, like, let's get the energy up. So I think that's another part, which I guess doesn't factor into the upside, but just seeing the way that he can move is just really unique. I think to some of the other quarterbacks in this class. And I think if, if he can get, the mechanics and, you know, the production there a bit more, um, you know, a, a decent bit more. I think that he kind of has the the upside just when you see how he can throw off platform and you can see how he can improvise. I feel like his game of the three quarterbacks is probably the best suited towards the direction of college football and where it's going. Just having a quarterback that can do so many different things. And um, I think part of that too, if you're also just looking at the um, upside at Oregon specifically, he was telling me about, and I, I, I told him that his game kind of reminds me a little bit of Bo Nix. And he was saying that was part of the staff's major selling point when they were recruiting him was, you know, look at what we did with Bo. We see a lot of, you know, similarities in your game. So I think that, uh, I, I think long answer, I'm going to say Moga just for, I mean, you maybe don't see it right now, but I think you see enough of the signs there to kind of see why Will Stein and the staff were so heavily interested and why they made him a priority and why they made him one of their guys.
Yeah, so let it be known that in the age of uh, social media, because I chose Van Buren and you chose Moga, we now both can't stand Austin Novosad. We think he stinks forever and always. Of course, that is uh, a facetious remark on my part because that's not the case. But I like your answer. That was very, very well reasoned. And I want your reaction, too, to the latest run of recruiting momentum, which you did hint at a while back on the show. You're like, hey, I think, think some stuff might be coming here and your next order of bird dogs might be coming your way as well because they look great. They make you feel great as well. They are super comfortable and their versatility is perhaps their greatest quality. You can wear them going for a swim. You can wear them out on a summer day. You can wear them on a hike. You can wear them on a walk. They are meant to be the perfect summer shorts so go get your next order of bird dogs right now heck you can wear them if you want to go out on a date max has got a girlfriend and maybe he wants to go out there and look really good bird dog shorts easiest way to do just that go to birddogs.com slash locked on college when you enter the promo code locked on college they throw in a free custom bird dogs yeti style tumbler with every single order they got tons of great stuff and their shorts are amazing so birddogs.com slash locked on college promo code locked on college get a free custom bird dogs yeti style tumbler with every order i hope before i made that impromptu uh line to include you in the ad read that you and your girlfriend have not broken up within the last couple days since i spoke to you (laughs) no no rule i feel like it's funny that you mentioned that because i feel like there's like buddies or people that i know that i go long periods of time without talking to and then when i finally check in with them like oh how is you know what's her face doing or whatever they're like oh we actually broke up i swear that happens to me like oh dude it's than I want it to. It sucks. I I totally feel that. Like, quick aside, I promise we'll get back to the Ducks. But it's such a guy thing. You know, my mom wanted girls. She got two boys instead. The reason she wanted girls is they actually, like, talk about that sort of stuff. My mom will ask me all the time, like, hey, how's so-and-so doing? And I'm like, who? "Uh, Fine. fine. You know, he's doing fine. Well, you don't talk to him anymore? No, we just, like, we, we... we, we talk when we feel like talking, which is like every couple months, yeah. <laughs> you know, like what am what are my closest friends in the world? I talk to them like, I don't know, once a week, maybe. And there are other people I talk to every day. It, it's definitely it's definitely a guy thing. Curious as your guys' thoughts on that, by the way. So drop them in the YouTube comments. OK, let's get back to Oregon football here. So the recruiting momentum has been palpable, Max. And you felt that a wave might be coming. It definitely did. Van Buren, Sedavian Sims. Now Dylan Gresham, the wide receiver. What's kind of your your big takeaway reaction to to what Dan Lanning and staff have been doing? Just just racking up the blue chips here in May of 2023. Yeah, I think that this recruiting run is really happening at just the right time, and I think with arguably just the right players. Um, you know, I think the more that I cover this team and you know try to get tapped in, you, know, you can kind of see some stuff coming, which is exciting. Um, you know, you got to look at what Oregon's doing right now, heading into the summer months, you know, guys are finishing school, hitting the road for OVs, uh, you know, end of this month, early next month. Uh, and Oregon's already heading into the summer with quarterback figured out, got a couple of, uh, offensive linemen, got a big time defensive, two def- big time defensive linemen, you know, Tioni Gray out in Missouri, Zadavian Sims out in Oklahoma, they're going national, which is what you have to do if you're a program like Oregon and you want to make some serious noise on the recruiting trail, you got to go outside your state. So I think they're checking all those boxes. And then, you know, just while all that's happening, they're still doing so, so much behind the scenes. You know, Michael Van Buren and Zadavian Sims stole the headlines, stole the show on Saturday during the weekend. But what was going on behind the scenes? You had a trio of really talented players from modern day, on campus for visits, five-star defensive lineman, Aiden Breland, just put the Ducks in his top 10, five-star offensive tackle, Brandon Baker. He's coming back for an official visit in June after being on campus for the spring game. He told me that that spring game visit left him wanting more. So what did he do? He made it back out to Eugene. Um, So all that was going on behind the scenes. Then you also have Fox Crater, Oregon's offensive line, another Oregon offensive line commit who's been taking a bunch of trips. They got him back on campus, try to get him to maybe slow things down a little bit after checking out a bunch of schools. So there's just so much going on, and and they're in the mix for so many guys. Um, I think that now Oregon's kind of going to find themselves in the position of, you know, are they doing too well recruiting some guys? You know, are they going to have to maybe turn some guys away in the 2024 class because, um, you know, they have all this momentum. Guys are going to want to hop in. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you maybe have to play the long game with some guys. You know, Brandon Baker has told me a bunch of times he's looking at December – as a commitment time frame, but every time I talk to him, 
Oregon seems like they're creeping up there, and I feel pretty confident saying that they lead now. So you got to kind of just manage the timeline, you know, getting out on the road, seeing guys. The coaches are all over the country. That's another thing you have to think about, Spencer. So my reaction to it is that it's exactly what Oregon needed, and I love where they're sitting heading into the summer. Yeah, I, I think the momentum has just been really, really positive and starting to get not just – four star guys but top 100 top 150 players which is an even more important recruiting benchmark for not just raising your rankings but also you know building the sort of roster that you need to win at the level that that we'd like Oregon to I want to transition into uh, another mailbag question again YouTube comments or on Twitter hit me up anytime get a question answer here on the show this guy's an everyday or his name of course is Blazer Duck one of the best probably the number one question answer here at uh, at Locked on Ducks we appreciate so he asks, Spencer, Oregon just landed four-star quarterback Michael Van Buren, four-star defensive lineman Zadavian Sims, both players ranked inside the top 130. Do you believe Oregon's 2024 class is going to be the best in program history? Do you believe that Dan Lanning and the coaching staff will make this new the new norm each year, pushing for the best class in program history, the way they recruit, love the show, keep up the great work? So I'll answer this first. I think the mindset is pretty clear. Like Lanning understands that recruiting is the lifeblood of your program. And if you're going to win at a high level, you have to recruit at a high level. He's made that evident and his entire staff understands that. I think they've all been in that sort of mentality from the moment they got to Eugene, right? You go back to the 2022 class and, you know, Mario Cristobal left and lost a bunch of players and whatnot. And we walked away with the number one offensive tackle who's probably going to start at left tackle this year in Josh Connerly, right? And that was a last second, just kind of get it together sort of thing. So I think their their ceiling is certainly to push for the best class in program history, but I do wonder, you know, whether they can sustain it at this level year after year. Because we've seen Mario, you know, push Oregon's recruiting to levels that it never has been before. But what Lanning is certainly striving for, it seems, and time will tell whether or not he can attain this, is is there another gear, right? Mario reframed what the ceiling was for Oregon recruiting. Lanning is now going to answer the question, is there another level to it? And, and I think the early returns are there's potential for it. Absolutely. I wouldn't guarantee it because recruiting is a highly competitive and, and difficult world. But Oregon, though, they don't have a bunch of talent in their backyard, as we all know. They have got the money. They have got the resources. They have got the staff and they have got the brand to go to a really, really high level on, on the recruiting front. And if Lanning sticks around for, you know, five, six years with the Ducks and, and the staff remains mostly the same, you're going to have some turnover, of course, if, if you continue to win, which I expect them to, then they are going to be able to recruit at a really, really high level. I don't think you can guarantee one way or the other, but I think that's not necessarily what they're striving for because they want to have that title. But I think that's just what they're striving for because that's the standard that Dan Lanning knows, right? The the Alabama, the Georgia background, like that's what he has seen work. And I think that's the sort of mentality and approach that he's bringing to the Ducks. Yeah, Spencer, when you were listing off, you know, all the reasons that Oregon, you know, is a, a contending recruiting power nationally, I was like, I'm waiting for the brand. That's got to be something that he, that he lists off on those bullets. And of course, you, you hit on it. Um so, yeah, I think – okay, so it was a kind of a two-part question, right, about 2024 being the best in program yeah. history and then trying to kind of match that each yeah, year. Yeah, and are they are they going to just continually try to, to raise the bar, right? If they get the best class this year, are they going to try and up that the next year? And, and I think the way that they are approaching it and the way that they are succeeding as well leads me to believe that they do have that growth mentality of we're going to do well this year and we want to do better next year and then better the next year. And that's what they're going to at least be striving for. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, so for the first part, I, I had a show uh, like a week and a half ago or something, like, you know, answering that very question. I think this 2024 class is going to be the best in program history. Um, very confident saying that right now, uh, you know, in May. Um, but I think that's going to happen, you know, with, with some of the people that I've talked to around Eugene, some of them were in the building uh, when Mario Cristobal was there. And the thing that I'm like, we all knew, we all know about the energy that Mario Cristobal attacks the recruiting trail with like Dan Lanning's different 
it's it's exceeding that. It's a different type of energy, um, which is kind of insane to say because you know when we got to know Mario and his approach, it was you know attacking the trail with like a relentless energy, you know what what have you. But he he saw everything that Mario did. I think he's doing that and then some. And you add in the NIL stuff and you add in the transfer portal and how it was leveraging that to kind of fill in some of the gaps. You know, maybe you miss on a couple guys. Oregon only signed one linebacker in 23, Jerry Mixon from the high school ranks. So what does he do? Gets Justin Jacobs, gets Connor Soley out of the portal. Um, so I just think that the the vision that he has for the program, it's just going to keep like and he said those very words, you know, growth mindset. It's It's every... They're going to do that every cycle. He knows that you can't get complacent. You know, Georgia, look at them. You know, they're they're top five, top three every year, and you never get complacent with it. Now it's like you just saw, I think someone was saying the other day, like uh, Dylan Rayola, like going to Georgia is like Georgia's getting too good and like it's like not good for the sport. I'm like, Georgia fans just got to be there like, you know, this is what we worked for. Like this is what you put in the effort for. So I think Oregon is, is really placed – in a unique spot to be one of the 10 teams in the country that can sustain recruiting at a truly elite clip every year. Uh, I think pushing further East is going to have a key part in that. And that's something that's going to take some time, but I I just love what I'm seeing from the staff and, you know, just kind of with my understanding of how recruiting works, I I think that uh, it, it is sustainable just based on everything that Oregon has going for them. So the highest rated, you know, overall uh, composite class ranking from 24-7 sports is the 2021, and that finished with a class rating of 287.67. And the number that Oregon is trying to to go for in that sense, I, I think, is is 300, which is reserved for, like, the, the creme de la creme of recruiting classes and recruiting powers in the country. Now, as of right now, their 2024 class is sitting at 224. Point five eight, but there aren't even any five stars in yet. in the class that yeah yet that, that that's exactly my point. As you look at the guys they're going after, whether it's Dylan Williams, well it's whether it's uh, Williams Nuaneri, whether it's uh, Brandon Baker. I mean, j- just just get Dave, Elijah Rushing, yeah Elijah Rushing, David Stone. Like they're going to land several of those guys, and that boosts it up. So I, I think the potential for twenty twenty four to be the best ever. Yeah, it, it absolutely is, and I think that the the way that they you know, are, are bringing in high level players and getting on their radars in a significant way over and over and over again, I think is really, really encouraging on that front in, in terms of what the, the recruiting potential can be. Uh, last thing here for today, I mean, we could go for a couple hours if, if we wanted to, of course, but we're closing out the week with another question from Nick who said, we're watching Oregon add wide receiver after wide receiver. Just added Gresham today when he sent the question in. Question, how many receivers are too many? Hearing Oregon is in a good spot for at least two more. So for Oregon in the 2024 uh, recruiting cycle right now, they do already have several wide receivers. Jordan Anderson, Tysier Denmark, I think I'm a, and Dylan Gresham. And they've obviously got several on the roster. But I, I think for a position like receiver max, all skill positions, uh offensively and you know i think this really you could argue this falls into any position group but i think when you talk about wide receivers and tight ends i don't know that there's such a thing as too many you know like you're not going to have 12 receivers in a class it's not going to go you know balloon up to some number like that but in the portal era i think you just have to be as prepared as possible for talented guys to leave your your position group room and be able to replace them with guys who are of equal or comparable talent so that you don't have a, a drop-off there if you have an injury over the course of a season or if a guy uh, leaves your program for one reason or, or the other. So uh, you, you said before we hopped on to record that uh, you had an idea of who the other receivers might be. So why don't you tell us about those and share thoughts on uh, the question about, you know, can you really add too many talented wide receivers in a recruiting class? Yeah. I mean, you, you would think that, you know, the answer is no, you can never have too many, but at the end of the day, you know, you do have to manage your roster. Uh, like you said, the ducks already have three in the fold. And then another thing to, for 24, another thing to keep in mind here, Spencer, is that um, the ducks did take three, portal wide receivers, but a couple of them, I want to say at least two of them 
uh, Gary Bryant Jr. and Tez have multiple years of eligibility remaining if they choose to use them. So like that's mm-hmm. another thing you have to look into. Like not every portal guy is just a one year rental type of deal. Um, so that being said, I think that the number that Oregon's probably looking at in 24 is probably four or five. I think I'm leaning more towards five receivers um, at this point. Um, you know, I was just at modern day yesterday and I talked to Jack wrestler. Uh, he's an under armor, all American wide receiver in the 24 class uh, had Oregon in his top five. Uh, along with, you know, Penn State, Boise State, Arizona State. Now that's looking like it's actually coming down to a top two. He was telling me Boise State and Oregon, and I'll have an update uh, on Ducks Digest on him uh, probably by the time this comes out uh, where he kind of just talks a little bit more about, you know, his outlook. But um, I think Oregon's in a great spot with with him. And then you have to look at um, a couple of other guys that maybe are going to get kind of the full court press type of deal from, from Junior Adams. I think one of them has to be Jeremiah McClellan out of St. Louis, Missouri. And then another one has to be Ryan Pelham out of Long Beach Millican. Uh, he has two official visits scheduled right now, Oregon and USC. Um, I'm not quite, I think uh, McClellan is supposed to be at Oregon for his OV on June 23rd, which is the biggest weekend of the month of June, just from what we're seeing right now and then how the staff is managing his visits with top targets that's the week you want to get as many guys on campus as you can, which kind of sounds like inverse thinking because like you'd want to be able to like focus on each guy, but just having a bunch of talent is always going to help. They'll probably get a bunch of commits out for their official visit then as well. So those are some names that you got to watch. Uh, Jeremiah McClellan and uh, uh, Ryan Pelham and then Jack wrestler. And then you also have some other guys, Oregon's uh, kind of trying to stay in the mix for Ryan Wingo, who is a seriously elite name in the 24 class also out of St. Louis area. I think he's kind of a long shot, but you got to try Terry Bussey, number one athlete uh, out of the state of Texas. He can play a running back or receiver. James Madison out of uh, Fort Lauderdale, St. Thomas Aquinas. He has Oregon in his top five. Um, I'm trying to think of some more guys that they they might be in the running for. I mean, just so many top tier guys. But I, I think those are some of the the main names that you kind of have to keep an eye on here when you're looking at what's next for Oregon. Gatlin Bear is another guy, a uh, super speedy wide receiver out of Idaho, has Oregon in his top five. I think Oregon's kind of fading in that one. I think I saw a report that it's going to be Boise State or one of the other schools in his um, final five, so maybe more so looking like kind of two in that one. But those are the names that I believe – yeah, okay, those are the – That's I was just kind of cheating and looking at my story. Is that it? What's, what's next for Oregon at wide receiver? And I was kind of just looking at all the names, but – yeah, four, four or five, probably more towards five, and then you know, look, looking towards some of those names that I mentioned. Yeah, and I, I think like we were we're talking about, it's just not an instance where if they get five, you look at it and go, ah, oh, they should have used it on X position or or Y position because you know, recruiting, especially in the portal era, is very much kind of throw it at the wall and and, and see what sticks, sort of thing. You're trying to find those you know diamonds in the rough because as you look. With, with the way you can bring transfers in and slot them into your starting lineup right away, you're, you're seeing fewer and fewer guys from a recruiting class make an impact, but still you want to have that talent and depth in there so that you can have a better chance of finding the next sort of high-level player at any given position, and, and wide receiver is no different. Max Torres covers the Ducks for Fan Nation at Sports Illustrated, host of the Ducks Dish podcast, tap into him at M Torres sports on Twitter to keep up with all of his recruiting stuff. Max, thank you as always, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on Spencer recruiting. Don't stop. So we just got to try to keep up with it and I love it. So can't get enough. Yes, indeed. By the way, just a quick note for everybody. No show on Monday. I will be traveling. I'm out of town for a wedding, so I won't be back uh, in in time to get a show then, but Monday off we'll be back in your feeds on Tuesday. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a great weekend. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And go Ducks.